Well, good morning. And we are back, and we are still looking at the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> we are coming toward the end, though, um, and you're going to see that probably in this study a little bit more. But today we're, we're in Luke chapter 19, uh, and we're, we're taking a look at a young individual named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, because Jesus is going to, in part of his travels and in his ministry, he goes into the town where Zacchaeus lives and is invited to his house and accepts the offer, and he goes to the house of Zacchaeus. And we're going to take a look at that today. We last time had touched upon the blind man who received his sight. And of course, Jesus said to him, you know, receive your sight. The man said, if you're willing, Lord. <clears throat> and we like to say that we're always willing, right? We're always willing. Um, well, God's always willing. And we can reach out to him and ask him if he's willing to heal us. Because he is willing. He, he does want to do that for us. And so this blind man said, you know, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, he's crying out to him. And finally, Jesus stops and he says, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? <clears throat> he knew he wanted him to do something. The man, the man said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. There's a very simple aspect to this story that you and I are, are seeing today, okay? Simple yet pure. A very, very nice, very nice story. Um, <clears throat> So it is interesting to see how our Lord has compassion on those who are less fortunate, unfortunate. It's something for us to imitate as well in our own lives. Well, now we're going to take a look at chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke today. And I'm going to read to us beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus <clears throat> entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. <clears throat> and he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of a short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for it was going to pass that way, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste to come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. <clears throat> and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, let's stop there for a minute. Notice Jesus, you know, Zacchaeus wants to know what was going on. He was the chief of the tax collectors and was very rich, I bet. And he runs ahead because he knows somebody's coming and a crowd's following. They're coming into the town. He runs ahead and he climbs up the tree. And Jesus walks through the street, comes right under the tree, stops, looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down for today. I'm going to spend the day at your house. And Zacchaeus comes down joyfully and brings him over to his house. Which is very interesting. Notice the judgment and the judgmentalism others had upon him. Ooh, look who he's hanging out with. He's hanging out with these low-life 
collect tax collectors who who are sinners and you know this can't be good so this was the perception of Zacchaeus by everybody around him and yet Zacchaeus when he was privately speaking with Jesus confessed this about himself he said Lord Lord I get I give half of my goods to the poor and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation I restore it fourfold he gives it back fourfold <clears throat> what this tells me is Zacchaeus even though he was a chief tax collector and made a living for sure. He also had a heart after God. He had a heart of compassion, not of thievery. He had a heart of compassion. He gives half of his wealth to the poor. So there's a selflessness there. And he also, <clears throat> We're told he also restores fourfold to anybody if he ever took anything from them by a false accusation. <clears throat> In other words, Zacchaeus is not like most tax collectors. And maybe that's why when Jesus saw him and stopped under the tree and looked up and he knew his name, Zacchaeus, because he knew his heart. A heart of compassion, a heart of selflessness, even though he was a tax collector. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. <clears throat> Indeed he has. Indeed he has. And he knew salvation had come to the house because there's a humility and a selflessness and a giving and an open heart in Zacchaeus. You know who is in the worst position here? Those who are judging Zacchaeus. <clears throat> Those who are judging Zacchaeus as to whether, you know, because he was mingling with the wrong people hanging out with the wrong individuals. That was the person who was in the wrong. Let's look at this next parable in verse 11. Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. And because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said this. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants and delivered them ten minas and said to them, Do business until I come. <clears throat> but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in little, very little, you may have authority over ten cities. The second one came to him, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. <clears throat> Likewise, he said to him, You also will be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in the handkerchief. For I feared, because you are an austere man, that you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. 
you knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? <clears throat> and he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him, and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. That's a heavy duty saying. You know, <clears throat> God gives us gifts. Everybody has different gifts. And he does ask us to use those gifts for his glory, his kingdom. And I think that's what he's asking us to do here. I think he's given an example of having used the gifts and bore fruit with them. <clears throat> if you had five minas and you earned ten, then he says you will, <clears throat> you know, I'll make you ruler over ten cities, right? This is telling us rewards that will be given at the kingdom, the coming of Christ. So you're looking at them here, these individuals, and each, each one of them invests in a little way, except the last one. So here's what he says. <clears throat> The last one says, you know, I feared you because you're an austere man and you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. You gave me something. I'm going to keep it for you and give it right back to you when you come back. Because I'm certainly not going to go out and lose the money. If I invest it and I lose it, that's not going to be good. You're an austere man, so I feared you. And Jesus said, well, why didn't you put my money in the bank so it could have a little bit of interest? Why didn't you do <clears throat> something where the fruit could be born from the gift that I gave you? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. So now it's kind of a little bit of an um, interesting scenario, isn't it? Now he seems to be being rebuked. They took the mina away and gave it to the one who multiplied and could continue to multiply the minas. But he said to the one standing by him, <clears throat> For I say to you that everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So... What does he mean by that? Well, if you have these gifts that God gives and you use them and you multiply them, then God will continue to give to you. Supply your need, give you the grace and strength and courage to do what you need to do to be witnesses of him. Yes, over and over, <clears throat> he will give you these things. And, you know, as you take a look here at the passage, it really does show us that to him who has, more will be given because he's responsible. He's a good steward with it. And the one who has not and yet tries to be a miser and hoard it, well, to him, there's going to be a problem, won't there? Because <clears throat> it's going to be taken away from him. So never just take the gift God has given you and hoard it for yourself, bury it in the sand. Use it. Use it for other people. Use it for humanity. That's why God gave it to you. <clears throat> now, here we are in verse 28. And when he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. 
And it came to pass when he drew near in Bethpage and Beth and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a cult tied, on which no one has ever sat. <clears throat> Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Because the Lord has need of it. So he's on his way up to Jerusalem, and we know the triumphal entry is going to happen here. But again, he shows his divinity and his godhood by letting them know that if they go and find a cult tied up, he tells them exactly where. They loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, you tell them, because the Lord has need of it. It's all you need to say. And they're going to go, oh, okay. This is all divine providence. And God <clears throat> um, organizing the circumstances for his triumphal entry. Verse 32. So those who were sent to went their way and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the cult, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the cult? And they said, The Lord has need of him. <clears throat> then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the calf, the cult, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, <clears throat> saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. <clears throat> Notice it was the Pharisees. So now he's coming in this, they, they bring the cult to him and he sits on the cult and they start spreading their clothes out in the road. Then they start singing his blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, right? Proclaiming him a king. And who rebukes them? The religious people of his day. The Pharisees, the ones who would have rebuked him to having Zacchaeus in his house, the ones who rebuked him for, you know, allowing that woman to clean his, his feet with her hair. Over and over, these things of compassion, these things of honesty, these things of courage, these things of lifting humanity up, have a negative taste in his mouth to the religious people of his day. <clears throat> And I, I wonder if that's not the same with us also. I think it is. I truly do think it is. Some of the Pharisees called to him in the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the very stones would immediately cry out, Pretty bold statement. The very stones would cry out because something divine and godly is happening here. That's what he's saying. If you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you surround and close you in and on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave you to one, with, with one stone left upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. He's talking to Jerusalem, the city. <clears throat> and it's true. They didn't repent. The Roman armies came under Titus Vespasian. They took apart the temple. They did not leave one stone upon another. Because 
the Roman soldiers heard rumors from the Jews that gold had been melted in between the rocks. And they wanted to go. So they spent all that time tumbling one rock off of another till they found gold. And as far as I know, I don't believe they found any. <clears throat> but think about that. This is something they did. The other aspect to this is, you know, Jesus said the glory has got to be given to God, right? So even if the children of Israel stopped glorifying Jesus, that even the stones would cry out. The very stones would cry out. <clears throat> and of course, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD in Jerusalem was a huge event. Hundreds of thousands of deaths, a barbaric event, even by the Roman standard. But it happened. Verse 45, then he went into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my father's, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and leaders of the people sought to destroy him. <clears throat> And were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So he had a zeal for God's house. Where does that come from? It comes from God himself. You know, very, very interesting scene. Look at chapter 20. Now it happened on one of those days he taught the people in the temple and preaching the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes together with the elders confronted him and said to him saying tell us by what authority are you doing these things or who is he who gave you this authority? But he answered and said unto them I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Oh, now that's a serious question, right? Then he begins to tell them a parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and he leased it to the vine dressers and he went into a far country for a long time. Now in the vintage time, he had sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the best fruit of the wine, but the vine dressers beat him, beat him and sent him away empty. Again, he sent another servant and they beat him also, treated him sharply and sent him away empty handed. And again, and again, he, he, a third time they watched him beaten. Then the owner of the vineyard quit. And he said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him and they will not kill him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, who is this spirit of? Who is this spirit of? Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may also be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and into the into and, and killed them and therefore what will the owner of the, uh, of the vineyard do to them and he said come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others and when they had heard it they said certainly not but when but then in this that is written the stone which the boat which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone Whoever falls on the ground or whoever falls on that stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind them to powder. 
and the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to slay hands, lay hands on him, but they do, they feared that the people, for they knew he had spoken his parable against them, which he did. He was calling them out to car. He was calling them out on the carpet for their <clears throat> their hypocrisy, their lifestyle. Uh, it, it was a necessary thing. They had to call him out. So. What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. A new house is being built. In other words, whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes at very hour sought to lay hands on him and kill him. Why is that? Well, he's given them a parable of the wicked vine dressers, <clears throat> and they knew it was them. Them, their prophets, all their religious ancestors, all of them are guilty. Jesus said, look, I've sent my son, my servant, to all places, all these different areas, and also to Israel, my own chosen people. I sent him there, and they didn't want him. They rejected him everywhere I sent him. It was bad. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or men? And he, and he gives them this question to kind of trap them, right? Well, if we say it's from heaven, then everyone's going to be like, why don't you believe him? And we, if we say it's from a man... Everyone's going to be mad because they hold John to be something more than a man. So either way, he kind of trapped them. Now we see the parable of the wicked, right? That comes in. Then he spoke to the people this parable. <clears throat> a certain rich man planted a vineyard, leased it out to the vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. We read this. And the servants kept coming and were beaten. Verse 19. And the chief priests and the scribes of very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew he was spoken this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize on his words, in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but, it, but teach the way of God in truth. For it is the lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not. But he perceived their craftiness, and he said to them, Well, why do you test me? Show me a denarius whose image and inscription does it have. And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and the things that are God's unto God. But they could not catch him in his words in the prophecy of the people. But they marveled at his answer and kept silent. Well, now Jesus pretty much shut them all up <clears throat> with that little parable. He let them know one greater than Solomon is here. We render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. There is a difference. Well, we're going to end it right there today. We're going to pick up from verse 26 on. So we'll pick up verse 27. I want you to read ahead as we come toward the crucifixion and the Last Supper, and then the glorious resurrection of our Lord. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Father... Again, we settle our hearts this afternoon. We listen to your word. We hear your peace. And we feel your peace going through us. Lord, help us to be better lights to those around us. That we might do so in a humble way. But in a way where others would be able to find your son, Jesus Christ, living and active in our words and our deeds. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. And amen. I will see you again tomorrow. God love you.